Good evening. I'd like to welcome everybody to tonight's uh, chess class. It's on op chess openings, in particular, the Ruri Lopez is white. That's a third move in the double king pawn opening where white plays bishop to b5, attacking the knight on c6. This is considered the, uh, one of the most promising lines of attack for white, and it was world champion Bobby Fischer's favorite chess opening. And he played uh, several games with it against Boris Spassky in the 1972 World Championship. Boris Spassky liked to play a defense called the, to the Ray Lopez called the Briar Variation. That's what we're going to go through tonight. It's considered one of the most, one of the strongest defenses to the Ruri Lopez. It, uh, Black builds a very strong position, it's a defensive position, and it's hard for white to break through. It's still popular today, as it was in Fisher's time. The guy who designed the opening was a Hungarian named Giula Breyer. In 1910, he won the Hungarian Championship. He was a very inventive individual, and he was one of the founders of the hypermodern chess school, starting around 1910 to 1925. The other, one of the other uh, major, he was a friend of Richard Retty, who he was also famous for the hypermodern school, and Aaron Nimzovich and Saviella Tarktikauer. Anyway, Breyer was a brilliant chess player, but he had, uh, he suffered from a serious heart problem, and his heart gave out, he died at the age of 28. But anyway, his chess uh, fame li lives on. There are several uh, other variations in chess named after him. But this is his most famous contribution to chess. So we'll start going through the opening. This game that we're going to go through there is a Russian named Dmitry Kokorev, Grandmaster rated 2636, very high. He's playing one of the top 10 Russian players in the world, Peter Swibler. His rating's 2745. They had a draw. This was played in the Russian Championship, the 69th Russian Championship in the city of Novosibirsk. October 20th, 2016. Just as a sideline, that Russian city happens to be the one of the scientific centers in Russia. And it's a very popular chess center as well. All right, let's jump into the opening. So the first move is uh, e4, e5, knight to f3, knight c6. Bishop to b5, this is the Ruri Lopez. They all start out this way. We're going to look at this particular line where black kicks the bishop right away with a6. This uh, particular approach for black was popularized by America's first world champion, uh, Paul Morphy, in 1858, before the Civil War. He was from New Orleans. They, uh, so this, this part of the opening was named after Paul Morphy. It's called the Morphy defense. Now, because the bishop is considered to be a little better than a knight, even though they both are given three points each in the valuation, or three, they're worth three pawns each, uh, white doesn't want to give up the bishop for the knight, so he retreats it. Now, black, black is behind in development. White has two pieces out. Black only has one. So black develops his knight. Notice that he follows the opening principle of every move is a different piece or center pawn. Or a pawn, the a6 pawn didn't lose time because the bishop had to retreat. So he didn't lose time with that move. Now the knight comes out to f6 and attacks the pawn on e e4, which is not defended. So you want to develop your pieces and make attacking moves whenever you can, and black is following that principle. White castles. He doesn't bother to defend the king pawn 
Because you can see if knight takes the king pawn, the rook can come over to e1 attacking the knight, and if the knight retreats, then the knight on f3 can take the pawn on e5, opening up the rook toward the black king. So white didn't have to defend the king pawn, he just castled because the rook over is so strong. Of course, black doesn't take the pawn. The main line, black plays the bishop in front of the king. Now, that's there for defensive purposes. See how it blocks, it, when the rook goes to e1, it'll block the rook toward the king and the bishop on e7 protects the f6 knight in case the white bishop goes to g5 to try to pin the knight against the queen, so bishop to e7 anticipates that. When you're looking at chess openings, it's more important than memorizing the moves. The thing you want to try to understand is why every move is made. Every move in chess has a purpose. So when you're learning an opening or learning more about an opening that you may already know, you want to ask yourself, why did the uh, grandmaster make this move? And there's always a good reason for it. So we'll go through the reasons. Now if you know the reasons for the move, eventually you can memorize the moves and that works hand in hand. But it's more important to know why the move is made than what the move is. If you just memorize the moves, after 15 or 20 moves, you won't know what to do unless you know why the moves are made. Okay, so anyway, once black plays the bishop to e7, now he threatens to win that pawn by knight takes e4. And if rook comes back, he can drop his knight to c5 and attack the bishop on a4. And if white takes the pawn, black just castles. You see, he can castle and there's no, no check by the rook on the e5. So white protects the pawn with rook to e1. Now you might say, why didn't white protect the pawn with pawn to queen 3 or d3 or knight to c3? The reason is, those are, are good playable moves, but white wants more out of the opening than equality. White wants to get two center pawns. He wants to get that pawn that's on d2 to d4, side by side the pawn on e4. But he doesn't just want to move it there right away because black would take it. Then he doesn't get the two center pawns. So what white's going to do, he's going to play the pawn on c2 to c3 first then play the pawn on d2, and if black takes the pawn on d4, then he takes back with the pawn and he has his two center pawns, and he controls all the center squares with his pawns. That's, so white is playing for a win and playing the most aggressive moves. So rook to e1, and that's why he doesn't bring his knight to c3 or the pawn to d3. He has bigger plans for his pawns. Now that uh, white, black is threatening to win, well, white, well, actually, white is also threatening, after rook to e1, white's threatening to win the e5 pawn by bishop takes knight. Uh, the, the pawn on d7 takes c6, then knight takes pawn. And if queen goes to d4 attacking the knight, the knight drops back to f3, attacks the queen, and the queen can't take the pawn on e4 because it's protected by the rook on e1. So anyway, white's now threatening to win the pawn on e5 after bishop takes knight. So black has to drive the bishop back with b5. The fact that black can play b5, that's the reason he earlier played the a6 move, kicking the bishop to a4 because he knew he might have to drive the bishop back with b5. So the bishop retreats. Now black strengthens his center pawn. He has a strong defensive pawn chain. The pawn on e5, d6, and c7, that's a black pawn chain. It's very strong. <laughs> now remember, white wants to get those two center pawns, so he plays c3 here. <laughs> 
And he's getting ready to play d4. Black, because d4 is going to come, and then white could trade thunder pawns. Black needs to get his king out of the middle of the board, so he castles. Now, white would like to play pawn to queen four right now, but white can't afford to do pawn to queen four because black can play the bishop on c8 to g4, pinning the knight. And then once the knight's pinned, black threatens pawn takes pawn on d4, c pawn takes pawn, black can do bishop takes knight, and if queen takes bishop, then the knight can win the pawn on d4, forking the queen and the bishop. Winning a pawn, trading off white's bishop, that black should win the game. Now, white could, in answer to the bishop to g4, take, takes on f3. He wouldn't lose the pawn if he did the g pawn, takes on f3, but he would have double pawns, and he had, would have ruined his kingside pawn structure. So before white plays pawn to queen four, he has to prevent bishop to g4, so he plays h3. We're at the uh, point where the Briar defense starts to the Ruri Lopez. And it's interesting to contrast the Briar defense with another defense called the Chigorin defense, named after a famous Russian chess player. Now, Chigorin in this position, would play his knight to a5 and attack the bishop to drive the bishop off that, that nice line on b3 and drive the bishop back. So the bishop, okay, so the bishop would come back and then Chigorin would shove this c pawn See how the, uh, the pawn is on c5 along with the e5 pawn? They'll fight the pawn that white's going to put on d4. So then white plays d4, and the game goes on from here, but we're not going to go into this opening. I just want to show you the older opening called the Chigorin defense. The thing to note, notice that the black knight is on the side of the board where it's not that effective. White's pieces are all in the center of the board where they're more effective. So the one drawback to the Chigorin variation is he's going to have to move that knight again to back to the middle of the board at some point. The Chigorin defense is still good for equality if you play it just right. The Briar defense is a refinement of this defense. So now we'll go back to the Briars move. And this move was very surprising to the chess players at the time when he came up with it. He actually retreats the knight back to its starting point, knight to b8. That violates the chess principle of not moving the same piece twice in the opening. And not only that, not only did he move it twice, he put it back where it started. But he had good reason for that. When the knight was on c6, see it blocks the pawn on c7. Black eventually wants to move the pawn on c7 to c5 to attack white center pawn that's going to be on d4. So the knight move clears the way for the black pawn to advance. There's another reason, and we'll get to it in a second. So uh, white carries out his plan and plays d4. You see that white has the two center pawns, e4 and d4. That's the most aggressive pawn structure in the opening for white, and it puts pressure on black's position. In particular, the e5 pawn, it's attacked by the knight and the pawn on d4, and it's only defended by the pawn, so black has to hurry and defend it one more time. Now Breyer's maneuver is to redevelop the knight to d7, where it protects the pawn. But notice here, the knight is in the middle of the board, 
not on the side like in the Chigorin. The knight defends the pawn on e5, and it also defends the knight on f6. So it strengthened Black's defense in the middle of the board and on the king's side. And that was his refinement of the Chigorin. Okay, now White got the pawn center he wants, but he, he needs to develop his knight and his bishop on c1. He hasn't moved those yet. Now the bishop, he doesn't move the bishop now because there's really no great square for it. If the bishop were to go to e3, it would block the rook from protecting the pawn on e4, and that would not be good. And if the bishop were to go to g5, attacking the knight, look, the knight's defended by the bishop, queen, and queen knight. The bishop on g5 is not going to do anything. And on top of that, black could gain a tempo by playing h6 and force the, knight, the bishop to retreat. So what uh, the right idea for white is to work with his queen knight first and develop the bishop later on when the situation is better for it. So white develops the knight to d2. Now, uh, in this, in the Rui Lopez, in this variation, this, that knight is going to go to f1, and from f1 to g3. So it's a three-move maneuver. b1, d2, f1, g3. Now, once it gets to g3, it protects the pawn on e4 and can go to the square f5, and it doesn't block the bishop on c1. If the knight went here and to e3, it would block the bishop, and that would be bad. It would, and the knight here would block the rook from protecting the pawn. This is a typical maneuver on the white side in the the Rui Lopez, you'll see it all the time. Okay, now, black knows white wants to re retreat that knight on d2 to f1 and then go to g3. So black develops, he needs to develop that bishop on c8, he moves it to b7. Notice how it's on an, this diagonal and attacks the e4 pawn and the knight on f6. He's, and if it's, that pawn's defended twice, attacked twice, white can't move to f1 right now. So white needs to protect that pawn one more time before he can do his knight maneuver. The best way he can protect that pawn, he voluntarily retreats his bishop on b3 to c2. See how the bishop protects the pawn. Now remember in the Chigorn defense, the knight came here and forced the bishop here, right? But, in the, but then the knight was stuck on the side of the board. Now in the briar, he goes here and here, and white had to voluntarily retreat anyway. So by he, his knight's in a better spot, and the result, the bishop retreated. That's why I say the briar is a refinement of the Chigorin defense. Okay. So anyway, he's protecting the pawn. He's going to do his knight to f1 and knight to g3. Black can't stop that anymore. So black's going to develop, redeploy, his, he's going to develop his rook on f8 and drop his bishop on e7 to f8, move the pawn to g6 and fianchetto the bishop to g7. So he moves rook to e8, white does knight to f1, bishop drops back to f8. Now, black is threatening pawn takes pawn, pawn takes pawn, knight takes pawn, and he's got it, at, the pawn's attacked three times, it's only defended twice. Black's threatening to win a pawn, but it, it, that doesn't bother White. White's going to move his knight to g3 where it protects the pawn, and every, White's fine. But notice that White, his knights are good, his bishop is undeveloped, 
His pawn structure is aggressive and better than Black's. Black's isn't bad, but Black's is defensive. Okay, now um, the other thing to notice about Black is all his minor pieces are developed. The bishop, the knight, and even the bishop on f8, he's going to redeploy the bishop. He plays g6. Now see how the g6 pawn takes the f5 square so the knight can't move here and the knight can't move there. And then the bishop can come up to g7 and work on this diagonal. So that's what black is aiming for. And uh, I think the fischer spassky game is a little different, but uh, we're going to continue with this. So white plays a4. Now black plays c5. Remember, I told you that was one of the points of the knight was to get out of the way of the pawn. And notice how the c5 and e5 pawns are fighting the pawn at d4. Black has his share of the center squares. White plays d5, gaining space. White has a pawn on the fifth. It cramps black to the, black has these four rows. White has a little, has more space, but black has very strong pawn structure and he's got his pieces nicely developed. So the fact that he has a little less space that isn't really a big, too big a problem for him. Now black plays c4. He has this pawn chain, so if pawn takes, pawn takes, rook takes, the queen can take, or the bishop can take. But he pushed the pawn here. It takes this square and this square away from the bishop, and it opens up this square for the knight. From here, the knight centralized and can affect these squares. So that's why he played c4. White plays bishop to g5. He f this was finally time to develop the bishop. Now, um, black has to kick the bishop with h6 right now. If he does some other move, like say queen here to break the pin, this queen goes here, and the queen and bishop prevent h6. So the right move for black is to hit the, the bishop before the queen can go to d2. Forces the bishop to retreat. Now black drops his knight to that center square. White gains a t moves his, develops his queen. The queen and bishop are attacking the pawn on h6. So either black has to move the king up, or he, in this case he chooses to advance the h-pawn one square. Now white messes up black's pawn structure. He takes the nice knight. The d-pawn takes back, and uh, black has double pawns, and white has a protected pass pawn. But this pawn is not going anywhere for a long time. It's blocked by the bishop and the queen. This is approximately an even position. Maybe a little bit better for white, Black has two bishops, but with all the pawns on the board, they don't have a lot of open lines to work on. White has a double pawn to work against, but black's pawn structure is pretty strong, and the two bishops give him plenty of defensive capability. So the evaluation of this position is approximately even, where we will soon be at the end of the opening, White plays queen to e3, tacking the pawn on c5. Remember, black wants to move his bishop on f8 to g7. He can't do that now because the pawn on c5 is attacked, so he protects the pawn with queen to c7. Now the computer gives this as a slight advantage for white but not a winning advantage, somewhat less than half of a pawn advantage. Okay. Now there are different uh, moves for white in this position. In this particular case, 
White chooses to retreat the knight to f1. Now you might be puzzled as to why the knight would retreat to f1. I know I was when I saw it. But when the knight's here, it can't go to h5. These white pawns keep the knight from moving in. And the knight blocks this pawn here. When the, he brings the knight here, he's planning to play g4 at a point in the future to attack this pawn and try to open up a line against the black king. We'll see that unfold. Rook plays his, uh, uh, black plays his rook from the E file to the B8 square. He moves here. What he's thinking about is he puts it on this line toward this pawn that's unprotected. And he's contemplating pawn takes pawn. And maybe this bishop drops back here to c8, opening up the rook line on this pawn. He's looking for a counterattack. Now the computer says that as an alternative, black could play bishop to g7, which we talked about. And this is still a little better for white. Rook e to b8 is also a little better for white because there's a drawback to the rook move. See how the rook protects this pawn and the queen that's attacked by the knight. When the rook moves over here, it's all up to the queen to protect this pawn. So the queen is tied to protect the pawn. If he kept the rook there, his king side would be stronger and the queen would be free to move somewhere else. So when black played rook to e to b8, it was what you call double-edged, had its pluses and minuses. Okay. Now we're on move 22 and white makes a minor mistake, according to the computer. White takes the knight on f1 and moves it to d2. It's not a mistake in the sense that uh, black can win a pawn or, or something. It's a mistake in the sense that uh, white missed a better move. And the better move for white is a little surprising, but it's queen to g5. See how the queen now is attacking the black kingside position and the knight on f6, which is temporarily undefended. The best move for black is just to put the bishop there to protect the knight. And here's another surprising move, but the computer says it's the best move. The queen retreats to h4. There's a reason for that. When the queen is here, the knight can retreat to h7 and attack the queen and force it to retreat anyway. White anticipates knight back and prefers not to, uh, to so he drops the queen back right now so that knight back doesn't win a temple. And with the queen here, white is contemplating pawn here. The queen protects the pawn, and he's getting ready to do pawn takes pawn. Or once the pawn's here, this knight will come up here, and the knight, pawn, and queen will attack this pawn. And if this pawn takes here, this pawn here, and then the rook files open, the king can come up, the rook can come over, and the queen and rook can come into the king. So. That's, what, that's what's good about queen to h4. It's a good move. OK. And uh, one possibility, black neat says, oh, maybe I shouldn't have moved my rook. I'm going to move it back. White plays his g4 move. Black brings the other rook over to the center. 
the knight comes up, the bishop drops back, and the king comes up, and uh, this is a little better for white. White defends the pawn, the rook is ready to come over here, and at some point, maybe rook here and the king can come here or here, opening up the rook line, and then play pawn takes pawn. Anyway, this is, uh, according to the computer, it's about a half a pawn better for white than black. Anyway, after this move, which is not as aggressive, remember, queen here has a real threat and prepares another threat, g4. This doesn't threaten anything. It gives black time. So now it's a completely even position. Black plays bishop to g7. He drops his bishop. Bishop comes to c8. Remember I told you that black wanted to drop the bishop to open up the rook line. Now black threatens pawn takes pawn. Bishop or rook takes pawn and then rook takes pawn here. So uh, white has to protect the pawn. Now black drops his knight to e8. The knight can come here and block the passed pawn and from this square the knight can attack this pawn. White plays his bishop up to e2. The knight comes up to d6. Rick comes over here. Now white's planning pawn takes pawn, pawn takes pawn, rook takes rook, winning a rook. Black needs to protect that uh, rook on a8, so he moves his bishop back. Okay, now white makes another minor mistake. He plays another passive move. He retreats his bishop to f1, again allowing black to equalize. He had a better move. He could have played more aggressively. The more aggressive move the computer recommends is to play g4, which is an exclamation mark, attacking and breaking up the black's pawn chain on the king side. The best move for black is to take the pawn. White takes back. Then the queen, the queen went to c8 because she has to protect this pawn because the white queen is attacking this pawn. Now the queen threatens queen takes pawn check and the queen and the rook and the bishop defend this rook. That's why queen here is the right move and queen here wouldn't be as good because it would leave this pawn unprotected. Okay. So to protect the pawn, White moves the knight to h4, opening up the bishop on e2, now protects the pawn on g4. Now the queen moves to a black square, d8, and attacks the knight that's not protected. White throws the pawn up to g5 to block the queen on the knight, but also See how the pawn blocks this pawn and attacks this square and this square. He would, and then white would like to bring this knight in or maybe move his, his king out of the way and bring a rook back over. Black can get equality here with a very fine move. He needs to break up white's pawn chains the right move is f5. Now f5 attacks this pawn. It also has possibilities of moving here where it attacks the queen. And once here, it blocks the queen from defending the pawn, so the threat would be queen takes pawn check. And if pawn takes pawn, pawn takes back. Now, white could do pawn takes pawn and passant, and white could also do knight takes pawn. 
it's getting very complicated. The computer says queen of g3 is the best move. And then it suggests pawn takes pawn. Knight takes pawn on g6. So now this is threatening to win this pawn. But notice when this pawn took this pawn, this pawn's now unprotected and the bishop can take this pawn. So there's lots of possible exchanges going on and it's going to peter out to a draw. Black ta takes the, the d5 pawn. When you're defending as black is defending, it's very important to take the center pawns when you can. Now the bishop was here, now it's in the middle of the board and it helps to defend the king side, it can move back here. Also, this, he could give this pawn up as a sacrifice pawn here, and then the bishop would operate down on this diagonal. White plays rook to d1. Now if he moves the knight, he'll attack the bishop. So the pawn moves up, it's a pawn sacrifice, it opens up that diagonal for the bishop. Queen takes. Now we get the knight in attacking the queen, so uh, black won a temple. Queen goes to h3 attacking the knight, but leaving the g5 pawn free, so black takes that. Queen g4, now we have a trade of queens. Queen to g4, bishop to g4. The knight was attacked. It has to drop back and attack the bishop because his bishop is in trouble. Black ha White has knight d7 check, winning the bishop. King attacks the knight. Knight takes the bishop, and the black knight takes the bishop and it peters out to a drawn ending. However, so in this position, white made a passive move and he should have played g4, which black could still hold the balance as we just went through. But white played a passive move, giving black an easier way to equality. So black just redeployed his rook to e8. White did pawn, okay. Now, here's an interesting thing. At this point in the game, remember black is higher rated. Top 10 player in the world. White decides to play for a draw. He could, white could have played for an advantage. White's position is a little better. The computer says he could have played for a slight advantage with h4 which would allow the knight to go into g5 at some point, and it would block black's pawns. Not a winning advantage, again, about a half a pawn advantage. But white decided to liquidate all the rooks and get a drawn ending. So we fairly rapidly get to a draw. So at this point, the game is completely even. He, so the bishop on a8 can't go anywhere, so the bishop comes here, then it can come back here and work on this diagonal. So it's important for black to bring the bishop back to the middle of the board. Now white plays h4. That's a minor mistake. When the pawn was here, it kept a piece from getting on this square. Now this diagonal is open and the black bishop can come here and here. The pawn was better here. So h4 is a minor mistake. The computer says that g4 would have been more aggressive, but again it's just it's just equality after pawn takes, pawn takes, bishop takes, hitting the pawn and g5 with an even position.
Anyway, H4, now it's a little better for black. Not winning, though. Black drops his bishop back. King comes up. Pawn to F6. The pawn on F6 does block the bishop, but it takes this square away from the knight and queen. So it's a, a good trade-off. White is going to liquidate the bishops now. Remember, white's playing for a draw, so he's trying to trade off the pieces. Now, black plays king to h7 to protect the pawn on g6. White makes a mistake, a real mistake here. It's a subtle mistake. He plays knight here. And we'll get into why that's a mistake in a second. Now what white should have played, he should have dropped his queen back here. Dropping the queen back here where it defends the back row. And uh, th th that would have been better. And he should get a draw if he did that. But actually, after moving the knight here, there's a great maneuver that black could win the game, but black, black actually misses the right move. But black starts out correctly. He plays the bishop to h6. See how the bishop is on the queen and the knight on here? And if the knight here was here, the, knight would, they would, the knights would protect each other, and the queen would be back here. There wouldn't be a gain of a temple when the bishop moves. So that's why the queen back was better. Okay, now, if the queen drops here, the bishop takes the knight, the queen takes, the pawn is left unprotected. Knight takes pawn, attacking the queen, that should win the ending. So white has to block the bishop line with the pawn move f4. Now there's a pin here, and pawn takes pawn, pawn takes pawn, that pawn's pin, the queen is on this line, blocked by the knight, but that should give black a combinative idea. The queen and bishop, after pawn takes pawn, pawn takes pawn, threatening bishop takes pawn, so the knight moves somewhere, opening up the queen line, this pawn's pinned, white would be in trouble. Black makes a mistake that makes the game a draw. He plays queen to a7, contemplating attacking down the a-file on this pawn and that knight maybe, queen here or queen here. It looks like a good move, and it's not a bad move. It's not a mistake, but it's not the best move. So the best move was to move the knight back. The knight protects this square, and now the threat is pawn takes pawn, Pawn takes pawn, bishop takes pawn, winning a pawn in the game. White has to protect the pawn, so he has to play knight to g2. Black does pawn takes, pawn takes. Now the winning move for black, and this is what the top 10 player in the world probably missed when he was calculating, he missed that he could play knight to e5 because this pawn is pinned and the knight comes to this nice square where it's anchored by the pawn and attacks the queen. This was, or the knight can come down here and attack this pawn which is undefended. The knight can come here and attack this pawn and white can't defend this pawn. See, there's no queen move to defend the pawn no knight move, and once that pawn's down, black can get a pass pawn with these three pawns against this one pawn by pawn here. This would win. Black might play queen to g3, and the winning move 
it's knight to d3 and there's no defense to the pawn on b2. So even the top 10 players in the world make mistakes. He played queen to a7. The knight goes there. Queen goes back to e7. Knight back here. So they're repeating moves. They're probably in time trouble. Queen to d7 check. King to h2. Queen to e7. Knight to d2. E to f4. G to f4. F5. Knight e to f3. F to e4. Knight to g5 check. Bishop h takes. King to g7. Queen to c5 getting the pawn back. e3. Queen back to the center with check. King to g8. Knight to f3. The knight from here can stop the pawn by knight takes pawn. So this is the right square. And the knight can come up here maybe and attack that pawn. It's protected here. And the queen can drop back and wipe out this pawn. So white's, anyway, uh, black plays the pawn up, obviously threatening pawn here, winning the knight. White counterattacks, attacking this knight. So if pawn up, knight takes, queen takes, queen takes knight, and then white has a dangerous pass pawn here. So black can't push the pawn up. Black goes back to h7 and the players agree to a draw. The computer says in the end, black had, he, he missed another good move here. He should have played his knight back here. Now, he probably didn't, they were probably in time trouble. It was near the end of the game, so they didn't have time to think everything through. Black probably, no doubt, he saw that if he moved the knight here, this pawn is unprotected, and queen takes pawn check, wins a critical pawn, and it looks like black's king is in trouble. But what uh, Black didn't realize, he can move the knight to g7. The knight there, the queen is here, it protects this pawn, and it blocks the queen from coming here with check, and then it frees the queen up so he can shove the pawn and win the knight. The best move for white is not to take the pawn check because of the knight to g7, but to block the pass pawn. Now, white, black can get the advantage by attacking with his queen. He's threatening the f4 pawn and the d5 pawn. The queen has to drop back. Now the knight can come to c7 and attack the d5 pawn. It advances, and the knight can go to e6, and the threat is on this pawn, and this pawn can't go anywhere, and black has an advantage here. It may not be a winning advantage. It's nearly a, it's a uh, considered a pretty good advantage, but it may not be winning. So, it's an interesting game, and it goes through the Briar defense. Now, we don't have much time left, but let me run through the first moves of the Fisher game. This goes back to 1972, Fisher playing Boris Spassky for the World Championship. And we'll just run through the opening a little bit. You've got the notes there on the paper. So, Again, Ray Lopez, a6, and we get to this position. Remember, in this position, he played the pawn so the bishop couldn't pin the knight. 
Now the Briar maneuver is the retreat of the knight and then over to d7. Okay, so now in the game we just looked at, the move was here to attack this pawn and weaken, make this pawn weaker. Fisher took a different approach against Boris Spassky and played here. Spassky played bishop to f8. Now, Spassky, bishop to f8, he, he can still get equality, but the easiest way to get equality, Spassky missed the best move. According to the computer, the best move is a5. Now. When white plays the pawn here, he maybe wanted to play here and do pawn takes pawn. By coming here, black's two pawns, he can liquidate the, if this pawn comes here, he liquidates the pawns and gets an even game. So by being aggressive and leaving the bishop on e7, he could have liquidated white's queenside pawns and it would have been an even game. And the main line goes like this, bishop to b2, knight comes up here fighting for this square and this square preventing this move, and if this move, well, then they can trade pawn takes, they can trade some pieces. White plays a3, he needs to protect this pawn, then he can shove this pawn up. Now black can do, trade this pawn and play c6. Now, he played c6 blocks the bishop, but this pawn was undefended. The threat was knight takes pawn. Black had to defend the pawn, and the best way was to bring this pawn here, and it also takes this square away. And the computer says that this is an even game. Anyway, Boris Baskey played bishop to f8. He can still, that's the traditional maneuver, by the way. The a5 would have been a new idea. White played a4. Knight to b6. White played a5. Knight went back. The bishop came up. And here, Spassky played queen to b8. This leads to an even game. He's planning to play this pawn here, and then the queen will protect this pawn, and the queen can operate down this way. Another way uh, black could have gotten equality here would be simply to play rook to c8 leaving the queen in the middle of the board where she helps defend the center and play, he can play c5 and trade off these pawns and that would lead to an even game. Okay, just a couple more moves. So this is an even position. That never stopped Bobby Fischer though. He played here. Now he's lined his rook up on the black queen. Black plays c5 to trade off the pawns. So you can see the pawns are coming off quickly, some knights. Now white gets to attack the black queen with his bishop, so he gains the temple. Black has a good move, queen to f4. He takes the knight, the queen takes. Now white takes the b5 pawn, so he's winning a pawn. Pawn takes pawn, he can do rook takes pawn. Now. Black says, you can win that pawn. Pawn takes pawn, bishop takes pawn, it blocks the past pawn, and the knight's pinned to the queen. So white would be in some trouble. White wisely doesn't win the pawn yet. He moves the queen over to break the pin. Now Spassky plays queen to c3. That's an okay move but he missed the best move. 
The best move for Spassky would be to liquidate the pawn. Rook takes pawn. He gains a temple, attacking the rook. So the bishop went from an unprotected square to a protected square, attacks the rook. Now, it, uh, let's see, white's the pawn up, but the pawn is not very useful for a long time. It's an isolated pawn blocked by the bishop and the rook. That pawn is not much of a disadvantage to be that pawn down. Black plays here. Knight to f3 and c4. And according to the computer, this is an even game. Notice that in compensation for being the pawn down, black has two bishops, open lines. He has a strong pawn, past pawn here. His rook's on an open file. The computer says this is an even well, actually, says it's slightly better for white, but uh, black should be able to hold the draw. Anyway, that's about as far as we'll go tonight. So that's a couple different ways to look at the Briar defense. It's considered perhaps the soundest, one of the soundest, strongest ways for black to defend the Rui Lopez. Thanks. Thanks for coming.